Hey, welcome everybody to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I am Ben Reynolds, host and producer of the event webinar series. Thank you for joining today's presentation. We're delighted to partner with Aurora Expeditions and offer multi-theme voyages aboard the revolutionary Greg Mortimer. The detailed itineraries for the departures can be found and downloaded in the handout section in the control bar. But now I'd like to welcome the panelists and presenters, Victor Emanuel, CEO of Victor Emanuel Nature Tours, Vent Tour leaders, Brian Gibbons and Rick Wright, and Lisa Bertini, VP of Sales of North America with Aurora Expeditions. Hello, everyone. Now I would like to turn it over to Victor Emanuel for some opening remarks. Well, we're just delighted to have this webinar and particularly have this relationship with Aurora. They have one of the finest staff and finest ships of anyone in the world. And working with them is a real plus for us. And these two destinations they are going to be talked about today are some of the best places you can go in the world and on one of the, the best ship you could go to these on. And so it was a, re, a real highlight of your year if you join either one or both of these expeditions and you will see remarkable scenery, remarkable birds and creatures. And I'm going to move on then to the next presenter. So let's welcome Lisa Bertini. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Victor and Ben, for having me here today. Our partnership with Bent is actually very long and um, hist historic. I've worked with Victor and team for quite a long time in my long history of expedition cruising. And Aurora and Vent are um, made to be together. Um, are an, uh, an Australian-based company that are fairly unknown here in the North America market. However, we have had a 30-year history exploring the polar regions. Um, we were founded by a man named Greg Mortimer. He His claim to fame was that he climbed Mount Everest and with the first man to do so without supplemental oxygen. So he is an explorer at heart, an adventurer at heart. And when he and his wife went first down to Antarctica 35 years ago, 40, 30, they were infatuated. And they came back and they decided to bring more friends and family. And thus Aurora was discovered. As you can see, our expedition ships, we have two, but I'm going to specifically talk about the Greg Mortimer today, has a very unusual bow. It's called an Ulstein X bow, and it was specifically designed to cut through the ice and reduce a lot of the shake of the Drake Passage. It also is fuel efficient and allows for true expedition cruising. Greg Mortimer... Lucky enough to meet him while I was in Australia is a man of um, an ex just an adventurous spirit and also a very true care of the, the planet. So his goal when he made this company was to have um, ambassadors of our planet leave. And that's what we've been doing for the last 30 years. In those 30 years, we've enjoyed a lot of firsts. We were the first company to um, have camping on our Antarctica Peninsula. We created the first diving trip to Antarctica, and we launched the first passenger ship with that Olstein Expo. People often ask me what makes us different. Well, first of all, it our expedition ships that were built. We have two. They carry 130 passengers. We have small groups, 130 passengers allows for a lot more exploration on land. And then also we have an immersion knowledge in part of our experience where we choose a group of experts that, were, that are alongside you the entire trip, explaining in a really uh, interesting way of what you're seeing. In addition with that, we also have then experienced wildlife birders alongside, which contribute to that overall um, knowledge-based experience. We are, like I said, Aussie-based, and there is a 
um, historic sort of feeling when you walk on board where everyone becomes part of the Aurora family. It's very convivial and um, everybody who leaves our trips usually have um, connections with WhatsApp or Facebook or emails that become long-term friendships. We are one of the um, companies with the most activities available and we, uh, we take our sustainability factor extremely serious. I hate to even mention it as a, as a item because it's always been in our DNA. It's not something that we decided to have just because. We've always had sustainability as number one and we are 100% carbon neutral. Part of our program is a citizen of science projects. So that means when you're on board, you contribute uh, into one of the seven projects that we have selected that really resonate with us and contribute the data to these actual uh, studies that go on. And the other difference about us is our expedition team. Our team members have been with us on average about 10 years plus. Um, they have worked together a long time and many of them are uh, renowned experts in their fields. So we have all of the ists. We have the geologists, the ornithologists, the biologists. We hand select a team depending on the depart on the where we're going. For example, in Scotland, we pick um, Carol, who has been a expert in his the history of Scotland, and she really brings the experience and the places that we see to life. Also, with Aurora, we do not. Um, you don't have to worry about extras when you um, come on board. Everything is included, including your pre, your transfers from the airport, the pre-hotel stays, all of your shore excursions, the use of muck boots that are waiting for you in your room, and a complimentary three-in-one expedition jacket, all port charges, all gratuities, and um, house mm -hmm. drinks with dinner, and any charter flights that are included. So here is a picture of the Greg Mortimer, beautiful ship. We This launched in the end of 2019, so we call him new. It was specifically created for expedition travel. This is an example of the mudroom. This, is, this mudroom is actually very innovative where you come back from your expedition or your Zodiac ride and you actually can have your own locker where you put your dirty muck boots that might have guano on them, your wet parka, and you keep that downstairs and not have to bring it up into your cabin. This, the thing about our, our, our ships is that they're beautiful base camps, beautiful food, beautiful surroundings, but Aurora's first and most important thing is to get you off those ships as much as possible. We try to take at least two landings a day, hopefully three, and get you off and exploring as much as possible. And here is an um, example of one of the staterooms. So I will leave you with 30 years experience, expedition, modern purpose-built ships, a very welcoming onboard um, experience and feeling on board, as well as a real true sense of sustainability is important as well as knowledge. So with that, I will turn it over to the um, partner trips that we are doing with Victor Emanuel. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, and yeah, now we're gonna go to the feature presentations, Svalbard Odyssey with Victor Emanuel and Brian Gibbons followed by Jewels of Costa UK with Rick Wright. And then there will be a video introducing the Greg Mortimer by Greg Mortimer. And then after the presentations, we will have our promotional offers and a live question and answer session. So here we go. I was privileged and thrilled to be on this trip to Svalbard in 2012 with Brian. I'd always wanted to see the northern part of the, the, of the Arctic Ocean and uh, the northern part of Europe and see, look there for polar bears. And I had a wonderful time. It was one of the best trips I've ever made. 
Uh, the boat is great. You never know what you're going to see, but you'll see wonderful things. I highly recommend it. It's a delightful trip. Uh, it's very different from seeing polar bears anywhere else in the world. And I've seen them also in uh, Canada. So I highly recommend this trip. And uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Brian to talk more about the trip. All right. Thanks, Victor. Thanks, Ben. Uh, indeed, I'll echo uh, Victor's thoughts on that expedition that he and I were on in 2012. It is an amazing way to explore Svalbard. And Vint has a couple of expeditions coming up with Aurora Expeditions in June of 2023 and June in 2024. Aurora owns its own ships, and this is the Greg Mortimer with that unique uh, Olstein x -bow. Um, it's supposed to be much more fuel efficient and a smoother ride. And this ship, I think, was launched in 2019. So that's the Greg Mortimer, and that's the one we're using for Scotland and Svalbard these days. When you're on uh, a big expedition ship like that, you have to get off the ship to explore those areas. And uh, so we use uh, Zodiacs. The Greg Mortimer has two uh, launching decks and a great mudroom for getting ready for going out um, onto the Barents Sea in the Arctic Ocean there around Spitsbergen. This is a wonderful analog map of what Victor and I did in 2012. Spitsbergen is the main island on the left. And then in the upper right is Nordoslinde. And there's a strait right through the middle of them. You can see our thread uh, tracing our path from 2012 through the Hinlopin Straits. And there were lots of great uh, bird cliffs there. The scenery is uh, wonderful everywhere. And you can imagine up in the boulder fields at the top of this mountain, um, there might be thousands of dove keys nesting up there in crevices and hollows. Of course, if you're going up to 80 degrees north, even in the summer, you have to expect ice. And there was a lot of ice around. And the wind and waves eroded to beautiful shapes and scenery. Just like us, you have to be ready for the ice. Uh, the birds do as well. Here's a black guillemot roosting on a little ice floe. They're a fairly common nester in little crevices along the, the rocky shores. Nesting on the seashore and in the barrens are barnacle geese. This is a great photo by David Escanio from 2019. More bar barnacle geese. Andy Whitaker was just there in 2022 this summer in June, and he saw these Atlantic puffins which are around in small numbers, but not common, uh, not as common as in Scotland or Iceland. Another bird that nests on rocky sea coasts is the common eider. And one of the most common birds with dovekey, uh, this is the thick-billed myrrh. Maybe a million pairs nest on Svalbard in cliffs um, all over the islands. They're uh, indeed like a common myrrh, but they do have a little bit thicker bill with that nice little white uh, slash on the bill. And they tend to be blacker rather than uh, common myrrh's brownish plumage above. This is a typical nesting cliff of common myrrh. Every little uh, horizontal space has a nest or a bird roosting on it. 
And this was the scene as we approached one of those nesting cliffs with 100,000 birds. They were just swarming. We didn't see any raptors in 2012. Uh, there may be a few peregrines around, but the primary uh, seabird predator would be this parasitic Jaeger. They can take small uh, rodents, but also uh, nests of the eggs and young of the nesting seabirds. Uh, one of the other common nesting birds, this is a gull called the black-legged kittiwake, and about a quarter million pairs of black-legged kittiwakes nest in Svalbard. Here's a foraging flock that we saw of thousands and thousands of kittiwakes. There were a few glaucus gulls mixed in and a few northern fulmar mixed in, but this was where fresh water was coming off the ice cap and uh, was very rich in nutrients, and so it created a lot of great feeding areas for the gulls. Northern fulmar is another bird that nests on the cliffs. David Escanio was lucky in 2019 to get a nice male king eider around Longyearbyen, the main town. And these are some of the duckies that I mentioned earlier. They, um, about a million pairs of them nest. They're usually high up. We didn't really see any colonies because they're nesting high in the boulder fields up in the mountains. Uh, because they're so small, they're very um, prone to getting picked off by glaucous gulls. So they nest up high in the crevices, not on exposed cliffs. Also known, the, the Brits and a lot of European birders call them the little auk. They are cute little things. Andy Whitaker got an amazing picture of the rock ptarmigan, which nests in the tundra up there. Purple sandpiper is one of the few shorebirds that nest that far north, as well as the following bird. That's the female red phalarope. The males are more dull colored. They do all the incubation and chick rearing themselves. So they're more camouflaged and the females are bigger and more brightly colored. Sanderling is another high latitude nesting shorebird. And the only songbird that gets that far north is the snow bunting. It's kind of like the house sparrow of the north. They nest around towns because they nest in nooks and crannies. So a lot of times they find little holes in buildings to nest in. Purple saxifrage, one of the flowering plants of the tundra. Every time we made uh, uh, shore outings, we always had a guy, notice the guy in the orange in the center with a gun. Uh, because you're in polar bear country, you have to be very conscientious when you're on shore. But the scenery uh, from day to day was just spectacular. Glaciers, ice caps, icebergs, rocky shoreline. And cotton grass was one of the common plants of the tundra in Indeed, it's not a grass, it's a sedge, but it is, but it does look cottony. We saw some amazing waterfalls coming off the ice cap. Um, and I'm afraid they're getting more and more common these days with climate change, but spectacular scenery. Here we are on shore with a group of walrus. The 
They are amazing beasts. They weigh almost a ton um, and they're equally beautiful and improbable in their looks. And they seem to like to stay with each other in these big groups, but then they often get irritated at the neighbor. So they would start bellowing and kind of stabbing each other with their tusks. Then they would settle down for another nap. Amazing animals. And on land, there were some very small car caribou. One of our typical Zodiac outings with a seal approaching the Zodiac. And when the gravel shore or the rocky coastline isn't available for the walrus, they can haul right out on ice flows to warm up, dry out. David was lucky in 2019 to get the blue whale, largest animal that ever was right offshore from the Svalbard area. In 2019, or excuse me, 2012, Victor and I had fin whales and humpback whales and minke whales uh, just offshore. This was one of our humpback whales that was uh, lunge feeding right next to the ship. It was an amazing experience. The humpback tail. There are two primary seals up that far north, the ring seal and bearded seal. This is the bearded seal. Notice it's really uh, strong whiskers, long whiskers on the front, small head. That's the bearded seal. And both of those are primary prey items for the polar bear, which is what this whole expedition is centered around, trying to find one of those guys. And this is an amazing photo, I think, by uh, Jackie Fortuna, Andy Whitaker's partner. She was up there in 2022 with Andy. You can see the polar bear in the lower center there with the ice flows and scenery in the background. It's just amazing. Victor and I were amazingly lucky. We had one of the, the most amazing wildlife spectacles of our lives um, from the ship on some shore fast ice, ice that's still remaining from the winter uh, that was connected to the land. We uh, found a group of bears and this was a mother and a cub and they were sniffing, looking around. And then we realized what they were sniffing and looking at. There was, they were kind of moving around. And then finally we saw this guy a giant old bear uh, with, we assume was either a stillborn or a, a beluga whale calf that he imagined he managed to catch. And you can see the attendant ivory gulls in front there. And we enjoyed this spectacle for at least an hour. The ivory gulls were sna uh, snagging little bits of the whale carcass when the bear wasn't actually eating. That's the look you would get if you were approaching that bear, try to get some of his snack. And there were several other bears around, like I mentioned, and each time when they would get rebuffed by this big rangy old male, they would take a little slide in the snow. I think it was like stress relief. Um, but everyone that got rebuffed by this male went and took a roll in the snow and ice. It was kind of comical. The uh, glaucous gull in the bottom left and ivory gull flying by that while that big male ate. Some of the other bears that were interested in the meal, but were just kind of loafing around in the wings, waiting their opportunity. And those cheeky ivory gulls would sneak in every opportunity to get a little beak full of 
meat or blubber when that big bear was eating. And that's my final slide. Um, thanks, Ben, for the technical help. And I want to say again, photos. I had a lot of my personal photos in there, but also from David Escano, Andy Whitaker, and Jackie Fortuna. Thank you, Ben. Good afternoon, everyone. Samuel Johnson famously opined that if you're tired of London, you're tired of life. I would never disagree with the good doctor, and I look forward on every visit to old favorites and new discoveries. This next time, though, in May of this coming year, London will serve as the jumping off point for an exploration of sites and landscapes beyond the capital, the sites and landscapes behind London's historical ascent to becoming a true world city. That ascent, of course, had everything to do with the sea. Our own expedition will take us from southernmost England to northernmost Scotland, from the mild climate of the Scilly Islands to the rugged cliffs of Fair Isle, midway between the Orkneys and the Shetlands. In between, we visit mighty medieval fortresses, Neolithic standing stones, Celtic crosses, a whiskey distillery, a sea cave that inspired literary forgeries and musical masterpieces. And there will be birds, lots and lots of birds. But I'm getting ahead of myself. After we assemble in London, our expedition starts out fittingly enough in Portsmouth, where the Mary Rose Museum is a chance to ponder the lives and fates of some of our older seafaring colleagues. The centerpiece here is Henry VIII's favorite ship, the Mary Rose, which sank in 1545 and was raised only in 1982. The ship and its contents are a sort of Tudor time capsule, so fascinating that some visitors actually overlook the Victory, the flagship of Nelson, which brought his body back to a hero's funeral after his defeat of the French at Trafalgar. For the birder, though, Portsmouth Harbor also offers chances at sandwich terns, pied and gray wagtails, and European shags. All those birds we can more or less expect to see again on our cruise, but they're still an exciting start to our list as we prepare to board our own, rather more modern vessel, the Greg Mortimer. I was on the Greg Mortimer with some of you late this past spring. And I think that you'll agree that there could hardly be a better ship better suited to explorations, natural, historical, and cultural. 
lavish space for its 132 passengers, skilled, knowledgeable, and friendly crew and staff, excellent food, a flotilla of expertly piloted zodiacs, and above all, excellent visibility from inside and out. I can't wait to be back on board myself. From Portsmouth then, aboard the Greg Mortimer, we sail west along the Cornish Peninsula. Cornwall still glows with the remnants of its Celtic past. The Cornish language, functionally extinct a year ago, has experienced a revival. And there are now those who learn Cornish before they learn English. This is the country of Tristan and Isolde. The wild coastlines and tiny, timeless villages of Cornwall have long inspired writers, composers, and painters, among them such famous names as Arnold Bax and John Opie. This sculpture is the Rook with a Book. It was created in tribute to Daphne du Maurier, alluding not very subtly to her short story, The Birds. We'll get to see living feathered rooks too, and a stroll up to the 16th century ruins of St. Catherine's Castle can produce a good selection of what I call classic Christmas card birds. Blue tits, great tits, chaffinches, and European robins. 30 miles farther west, the Isles of Scilly are the southernmost land in the United Kingdom, and they have a climate to match. On Tresco, second largest of the Scillies, the Abbey Gardens look downright tropical, but it's the birds of cold seas that will draw much of our attention during our time in the Scillies. Northern gannets, great cormorants, and of course, Atlantic puffins, all nest here on steep cliffs and sea stacks, along with shearwaters, storm petrels, and my favorite, the unassuming little rock pipit. The Scillies have their own birding culture. There are books written about birding the Scillies. That culture developed over decades and decades of intense birder coverage, especially in the fall, when vagrants from the New World are blown by prevailing westerlies to these rocky isles. Our exploration of Cornwall then continues with a day in Penzance. Once the bustling center of the mining industry in Southwest England, Penzance is now a delightful beach resort full of quiet cobblestone alleys, luxuriant gardens and friendly pubs where Cornish pasties are still on the menu. Here we have a wide variety of sightseeing and birding activities to choose from, including the mining museum at Botalic, the point of departure for the 250,000 Cornish miners who carried their techniques and technologies across the world. More famous even than Penzance and its comical pirates is the island of Lundy. The very name is a first clue to what lives here. Lundy and related words in the North Germanic languages mean puffin, a name reflected too in the former genus of the tufted puffin, Lunda. Other generic names have included Mormon, referring to the mask-like bills of these bizarre little auks, and the current name, Fraturcula, the little monk, in honor of their black and white plumage and upright posture. A whole suite of North Atlantic seabirds nest here on Lundy. In addition to the puffins, there are razorbills, common murres, fulmars, shags, and kittiwakes. The rock ledges that serve as their nesting sites are in high and sometimes contentious demand. The fulmar, the northern fulmar, is one of my very favorite seabirds. This is the only petrel species nesting in northern Antarctic waters. Fulmars are superficially gull-like, as Makio Falkenberg's beautiful photo here reveals, but they're quickly recognized at sea by their short tail, rather blunt wings, deep full breasts, swollen looking neck and head, and stout bill with tubular nostrils. Those tubular nostrils, the tube nose, are used for excreting salt and, as we now know, for helping the birds sniff out their prey at sometimes incredible distances. The fulmar, like the puffin, has left a cultural mark in the North Atlantic. We know that early Germanic sailors had close contact with these birds, since the name fulmar, given to them by Viking raiders, means stinky gull, 
a reference to the fulmar's habit of spewing oily vomit when it's in the hand. That knowledge gives an entirely new riches, richness of meaning to a famous passage in the Old Norse Hofred saga, where one of the less couth characters is described as flopping drunk into his honeymoon bed like a herring stuffed fulmar. The Norse influence grows only more marked as we leave English waters for Wales. The Welsh islands of Skomer, Skokholm, and Grassholm still bear the names given them by Viking visitors more than a millennium ago. These islands and their wild inhabitants are extremely sensitive to human disturbance during the short, intense breeding season, and only a very few landing permits are issued each day. We, though, will circumnavigate this trio of islands. And if weather and seas allow, we'll be able to launch our zodiacs and sea kayaks, too, for closer views of the birds and mammals. As I'm sure many of you have experienced yourselves, these small, quiet vessels seem to simply disappear into the landscape for most of the wildlife, which is then free to behave naturally, as if there were no curious humans within miles. Many of the seabirds and shorebirds and waterbirds can be watched at breathtakingly close range, but we'll also be looking out here for seals, cetaceans, and what I think of as the classic passerine of North Atlantic cliffs, the red-billed chuff. These small, glossy crows are astonishingly acrobatic, even by the high standard set by the rest of their family. And the extravagant dashing and swooping of a pair or a small noisy flock in front of the sheer cliffs they nest on puts to shame even the most maneuverable swallow or falcon or swift. Wales is in many ways the most mysterious of the countries that make up the United Kingdom. Its Celtic language has been successfully revived and it's possible to enter a pub or cafe almost anywhere in Wales and find yourself the only one obliged to order in English. And the mighty past of the country is everywhere. From Holyhead, the biggest town on the North Welsh island of Anglesey, we travel across the island to Carnarvon, where the massively imposing castle ruins dominate the cityscape. As at many of our cultural sites, an expert local guide will lead us through the castle, regaling us with tales of its construction in the early 13th century and its place in history, both military and diplomatic. Carnarvon is where the investiture of the princes of, princes of Wales has been performed for nearly 700 years, though that tradition may finally have come to an end. We leave Wales, reluctantly, and sail back out into the Irish Sea, where our next landing is the Isle of Man. Like the Channel Islands, Man is a crown dependency, not strictly speaking part of the United Kingdom and not a sovereign state either. The Manx Parliament is said to be the oldest in continuous existence, founded toward the end of the 10th century. Most people know this 220 square miles in the Irish Sea for its almost tailless cats and its four-horned sheep, if they know it at all. And many have heard about the putative extinction of the Manx language, an extinction that proved reversible. As more and more Manx are learning their ancestral language, and there are even a few families on the island that speak Manx at home and teach it to their children as a first language. We birders, though, know what's really important, and that's the Manx shearwater. The Manx shearwater is another tube nose, like the fulmar, but unlike that great lumbering bird, this is an elegant black and white seabird, slender winged and slender billed, and it nests not on exposed cliff ledges, but discreetly in burrows. This species is uncommon in the United States and Canada, but it's one of the most abundant and quickly one of the most familiar seabirds off the British, Irish, and Manx coasts. There are likely to be days aboard the Great Mortimer when our tallies approach or even exceed a thousand individuals. There's a particular pleasure in watching Manx shearwaters in Manx waters, and that pleasure is increased by the knowledge of the role this species has played in the history of ornithology. In 1952, a clarinetist in the Boston Symphony volunteered to help out with a seabird census in the Irish Sea. 
He went home to Massachusetts, and when he arrived at Logan Airport, he released a banded Manx shearwater that he'd carried with him across the Atlantic. Amazingly, that same marked shearwater was on its nest off the west coast of Wales 13 days later. It had flown on its own more than 3,000 miles across the Atlantic and settled in as if nothing had ever happened to it. This was by far a new distance and speed record for any tracked wild bird, and 70 years later, that Manx Shearwater is still warmly remembered for its accomplishment and for the inspiration it provided to generations of researchers still working on the mysteries of bird migration and navigation. Farther back in time, the Manx Shearwater played a different role in the lives of the human inhabitants of these remote islands. The salted and smoked carcasses of shearwater nestlings were a greatly appreciated delicacy from at least the 13th to the end of the 18th centuries, and vast numbers were shipped from the Isle of Man to the British mainland. This was a much needed source of income for the islanders. Those greasy, fishy snacks were known in the trade as puffins, meaning simply little fat thing or little puffed up thing. The transfer of that name from the shearwater to the bird that we know as the puffin is thought to have been inspired by the fact that those two species, both of which are edible, often nest in adjacent burrows, and puffin came to be used indiscriminately for both until its application was fixed at the end of the 18th century to the bright-nosed auk that we use the name for today. The Isle of Man also comprises an impressive range of terrestrial habitats, and such charming passerines as the northern weed ear, the greater white throat, and the gray wagtail are all found on the rugged heaths and in the high elevation grasslands here. Most importantly, the Isle of Man is one of the last remaining strongholds in any of the British Isles for the hen harrier. This is a close relative of our northern harrier that has nearly vanished from England and Scotland after many years of habitat loss, indirect and direct poisoning, and bitter and illegal persecution by grouse hunting interests. The Manx Wildlife Trust has for several years now coordinated a program that educates island residents about their great good fortune in still hosting healthy numbers of this increasingly rare raptor. The trust also arranges subsidies for local farmers to maintain the wild grasslands and moorlands that these harriers need for nesting and hunting. 130 miles farther north, above the 57th parallel are Scotland's Hebrides. Isla is the southernmost island in this famous archipelago, occupied since the Stone Age and once the seat of government for the entire island chain. This impressive standing stone is traditionally said to be the grave marker of King Godred Coven, a major player in North Sea politics in the second half of the 11th century. Today, Isla is kind of a sleepy place, with the notable exception of its whiskey distilleries. Ardbeg, named for the small promontory the distillery occupies, has been produced here for more than two centuries, and it happens to have been my favorite long before this cruise ever crossed my horizon. The Isla Woolen Mill is equally venerable, still creating fine textiles from local wool wo woven on looms that date back to the mid 19th century. The best known birding site on Isla is the Loch Grunart Reserve. I wish that we could be assured of promising views of corn crakes like this. The big buffy land rail is actually fairly common here, but it's secretive as it is everywhere in its narrowing range. We may hear the nasal grunting calls of the corn crakes, but we're more likely to see somber common buzzards or flashy, glossy northern lapwings. We'll tear ourselves away to visit Iona and the neighboring island Mesa of Staffa. Iona is the cradle of Christianity in Scotland when in the mid sixth century, a group of Irish missionaries landed here to found a monastery. The scriptorium on Iona produced some of the most famous manuscript books in European history, including the Book of Kells, which was moved to the Irish mainland during the Viking depredations of the late 10th or early 11th centuries. It's now in Dublin. More fancifully, 
Staffa, the little island off of Iona, is the location of the sea cave known as Fingal's Cave. Fingal, historically, was the son and heir of Godred Coven, the king whose putative gravestone we just saw. A fictional Fingal, though, was the hero of a series of epic poems said by their discoverer to be the work of an otherwise unknown early medieval bard named Ossian. It turned out, though, that these poems were the work of James Macpherson, a mid-18th century Scottish author who forged them and passed them off as genuine Gaelic antiquities. But before that deceit was revealed, these Ossianic poems and songs were the talk of Europe, and they encouraged and affirmed the antiquarian enthusiasms of continental romanticism. The Staffa Sea Cave was named for that fictional Fingal, and it quickly became a major tourist destination. Its most famous visitor was Felix Mendelssohn, who found the site so inspiring that he wrote a concert overture, first entitled The Desolate Cave, then called Fingal's Cave, and finally The Hebrides Overture. Weather and seas permitting, we'll get a close-up view ourselves in the Greg Mortimer Zodiacs or even by sea kayak, entering the cave in search of our own inspiration. Our next stop then is St. Kilda, home to some of the most significant seabird colonies in the North Atlantic. Both the gannet and the puffin colonies here routinely number 120,000 pairs and common murres, razorbills, and northern fulmars are nearly as common. Most notably, nearly all of the leeches storm petrels in Europe breed here, and we have a reasonable chance at seeing a few of these little seabirds over the water, though most of them approach the nesting areas only at night, when their calls are a characteristic and characteristically eerie part of the nocturnal soundscape. For many birders, though, it is a tiny, terrestrial passerine that is of the most interest. The wrens of St. Kilda are large, large and gray compared to those of the British mainland. And like a number of other island populations of this very widespread bird, they probably merit recognition as a distinct species. Another good candidate for full species status is the wren of Fair Isle, midway between the Shetlands and the Orkneys, the penultimate island stop on our cruise. The Fair Isle Bird Observatory is one of the most important ornithological research stations in Europe. Its buildings, its library, and its equipment burned, unfortunately, in 2019, but the long process of rebuilding may have been completed by the time we visit next spring. Even if not, there will be no shortage of things to admire on our landing here. In addition to the Fair Isle wren, species or not, and the full complement of breeding seabirds, Fair Isle is a mammal watcher's paradise, and it offers us the best chances to see whales, sometimes even including orcas or minkies. Surprisingly, Fair Isle also has a very rich flora and will be there at just the right time to enjoy the early spring's blossoming. Our final island stop is Papa Westray in Scotland's Orkney Islands. Human settlement here reaches back as far as six millennia, and this stone house is claimed to be the oldest preserved residential structure in Northern Europe. And north it is indeed. We're just shy of 60 degrees north here, and the breeding bird life has a decidedly polar flavor. In addition to the other more widespread seabirds, here on Papa Westray, we'll be looking for Arctic terns, great skuas, and even nesting parasitic Jaegers, which the British, of course, call Arctic skuas, tellingly enough. Even here, though, the plant life is, the plant life is rich, and May is exactly the season of first blooming for the Scottish primrose, a lovely, if modest, flower found nowhere else in the world than the northern coast of Scotland and the Orkneys. Nowhere else in the world. That phrase is going to recur as we arrive at our point of debarkation in Aberdeen and begin to look back at all we've seen, experienced, and enjoyed on our expedition through England, Wales, Scotland, and so many islands, all of them genuine jewels of the United Kingdom. I hope you'll join me 
on this exciting voyage of discovery in May of 2023. We're standing on the bridge of a ship called the Greg Mortimer, which just happens to be my name as well, which is very, very strange. What does it feel like having a ship named after you? It's uh, more bizarre than you could possibly imagine. It's very confusing because everywhere I walk on the ship, I see things with my name on it. So that's humbling and disorienting at the same time. This vessel is a world first. It's extraordinary. It is a new class of ship. It's a 1A Polar Class 6 vessel. We've just been from Tierra del Fuego to the Antarctic Peninsula and now we're on the way back again. On the way down we had a blissful ride. Sweet as traveling on marshmallow. And then, on the way back, we got punched in the nose. We've seen nine meter waves throughout the day. Very keen to see that moment, to see how the ship would perform. And it's beautiful. This ship did everything the designer expected of it and more. The bridge is my favourite place on the ship. I spend most of my day uh, while we're on the ship up here. And it's like, in this case, being on the Starship Enterprise, it's pretty spacey. And of course, it's the engine room driving the ship and, and here the, the skill of the ship crew comes to the pointy end of how the ship interacts with the rest of the world and the oceans. And so you can see it all unfold here. And very importantly, and critical to our expeditions, is this is open to all the passengers. We, we spend as much time as we can up here. And that's a rare treat. This is a ship's library, and it's a very intimate space. And in particular, I think it's a really beautiful space to get a sense of the quality of the vessel, the colours and the textures. It's soft, it's inviting to be in, and you can watch icebergs go by. <laughs> As you can say, see, the, the walls at either end of the library have uh, a collection largely of polar books. Uh, and then as we spread our wings throughout the world, it'll fill up with the rest of the world's books, beautiful places. This is the Elephant Island Bar, and we're right next to the lecture room. And some would say it's the heart of the ship. Uh, not because it's a bar, because it's a meeting point. Um, there's a reception and dining room nearby in the lecture room, and it's a lovely open space, um, graced by a piano in the corner. And it, it's a nice, deliberately styled, relaxed place. So, as you can see, it's a, it's a fairly slick, it's a sophisticated, relaxed place. Bearing in mind that we're not a, we're not a formal company. It's a, it's a very fine space, but we might come in here after a landing in our, uh, our long johns or, or our outdoor gear. And down the corridor, you can see the main dining room, our dining room. This is on deck five, and then on deck seven, where the library is, there's also a gymnasium, a spa and massage room. This is the ship's lecture room. And as you can see with the sun streaming in, it's a beautiful place with big windows. And we spend quite a bit of time in here learning about the Antarctic, for example, and having briefings about the places that we're going to go and coming in and 
uh, relaxing in the evenings and talking about what we've done. It's a vital part of the ship and it's a very beautiful space as you can see. Importantly we also use it to talk about specific activities, maybe kayaking or skiing or diving uh, and we're able to brief people uh, readily here. But the nuts and bolts end, all those things come together in the mud room, in the stern. Okay, we're in the mud room now, so we're towards the stern of the ship. You can hear the propellers whirring away, that's the background noise. And this is where the rubber hits the road, because all the talk and the learning comes together here, and we get ready to go out to Antarctica or wherever it is. Um, a locker for every room for people to hang their wet gear and for wet weather boots, muck boots, so you don't have to take them into your cabin. And it's separated from the rest of the ship, so this is the working area, the fun bit. Not only is the mudroom used for simply going onto the shore, there's more complex activities going on. This is where we prepare people for diving, for kayaking, for snowshoeing, skiing, going climbing, all the good stuff. What you see in the mudroom, in the design of the mudroom, and, and it extends throughout the ship, is a synthesis of 25 years of our experience. And that's in expeditions of having contact with the places. And dare I say it, as extraordinary as the ship is, for Aurora, it's all about the place. It's about getting out there in the place. That's what makes us tick. Well, thank you for those wonderful presentations, Brian, Victor, and Rick. Now we'd like to go over the summary of our upcoming departures. Uh, Svalbard Odyssey aboard the Greg Mortimer, June 7th through 19th, 2023, with Joao Jara. And we also have a 2024 departure with Rafael Galvez. And Jewels of Coastal UK aboard the Greg Mortimer, May 3rd through 17th of 2023 with Rick Wright. And for 2024, we will have Wild Scotland, May 26th through June 7th with Rick Wright. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Lisa to talk about the Aurora uh, promotions and discount offers. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for uh, finding that video again. I just love how Greg describes our products. So thank you for showing that again. I haven't seen it in a while. Um, with Vent, as a partner, we have put together some special promotions. Um, the first is for 2023. We're offering a thousand dollar air credit credit per person on both Jewels of Coastal UK and the 2023 12 Day Svalbard Odyssey, and there are savings of up to 20 percent on both of those trips. Looking forward to 2024, Wild Scotland, the 12 Day is savings up to 25 percent. And then our Svalbard Odyssey in 2024 is a savings of up to 15%. So now is the time to book. I also wanted to mention 
one of the things that a lot of people question is our COVID protocols. And uh, Victor and Victor's philosophy and Aurora's philosophy are exactly the same in that we use every precautionary rule to keep everybody, our staff and our clients safe. And we have decided to continue to require vaccines uh, to go on our trips. And we also require a PCR test prior to embarkation. And then currently we are testing on board at day seven. So um, I just know that that is a question in everybody's mind and we have held true. I know there is a lot of companies out there that are loosening their regulations and Aurora because of our size and because of the small size of our staff, we are continuing to use every precaution out there for COVID protection. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for that update, Lisa. Uh, let's ask the audience if they have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat portion in the toolbar. Uh, here's one from uh, Martha. Uh, she said she traveled with Brian on Vent's Wild Scotland trip aboard the Greg Mortimer in May with some of these same stops as the upcoming cruises. The partnership between Vent and Aurora provides the ultimate natural history experience on a luxurious ship. Having also been to Svalbard with David in 2019, I can say that the upcoming trips will be absolutely incredible. Must do experiences. Well, thank you for that testimony, Martha. That's incredible. Antonia wonders uh, how many COVID boosters. Uh, do you know about that, Lisa? Well, our COVID requirements are that the vaccines either um, the two or a one, depending on which one you have, and then the booster related. The booster that is currently out, which I believe is a multi, they call it a multi-omicron, is not required. It's the booster that was available last year at the time of the vaccines. And also, I think as that information changes, our tour operations manager, Greg Lopez, will have the most up-to-date information. So. Yeah, and, and thanks, Ben, for mentioning that because uh, we are currently always looking at what's happening on board our ships and um, how our process is working. We were actually even more stringent on our onboard testing when we first launched our season. We had two testing times on board, and now as we've been successful uh, moving through our first two or three departures, we have limited to now just one testing on board. So Ben, you're exactly right. Two, one month, three months from now, everything could be a little bit different because we are always looking at what's happening and transitioning um, accordingly. Our website, will be updated and as you know um greg will be able have the ability to know exactly what our our protocols are at the time of deposit and booking uh, here's a question that i'd like to to send to rick uh how does the birding part of the tour with vent interact with the rest of the tour yeah that's a great question and i think that we can combine the answer um with the answer to the question that jan just put in is everyone on the ship clients with Vent or are there participants from other companies? Um, the Vent cohort on the trip is a subgroup of the entire um, cruise set of participants. So we are a smaller group with a closer focus on birding and nature than, um, than the larger group may have on a given day. It's always my ideal that we have specific birding and nature activities, sometimes as an alternative to the activities that the larger group is taking, sometimes as one of those activities with the larger group. Our interactions between the smaller vent cohort and the larger entirety of the passengers on the ship is very open and easy. Um, I, I tend to think of the, the boundaries between our group and the larger group is entirely permeable. Uh, when we're on board, we find that there are people in the larger group who for whatever reason did not sign up with Vent, but are very much interested in birds. And they tend to 
hang out with us. Um, we also, as the vent group, on days when there are alternative trips, when there's say a, a, a shopping landing and a birding landing, um, there's no problem at all if someone from the vent group decides to go shopping instead of birding that day. So it's very loose, very easy. Um, we do have an identity and a sense of cohesion as the vent group, but we interact quite freely with the, with the rest of the participants. Great, thank you for that. And I think that uh, may conclude our session today for I don't see any more questions coming in. But please, if you have further questions or comments, you could reach out to me, Ben, at ventbird.com, and we can see to it that you get the proper answer. So with that, I want to thank everybody, all our panelists and presenters and the audience alike. Thank you so much for your time today. I hope you'll consider joining one of these upcoming destinations, and I hope you have the rest of your day to be a great day. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Those are great offers. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye.